More than likely, you already know what a Rubo workbench is, but for those of you who are new to workbenches and Andre Jacob Rubo, sit back while I share some general background information. If you are here just for the workbench info, please feel free to jump ahead. I'm going to preface the next part of this video with the following disclaimer. I am not affiliated with Lost Art Press or Christopher Schwarz in any way. I am, however, a huge fan. I often praise and curse his name for getting me into woodworking. André Jacob Rubeau was an 18th century French master carpenter and cabinet maker. He came from a family of craftsmen, and even though his upbringing was humble, he taught himself to read and write. He worked in the trade for many years. The same year he became a master craftsman, he published the first volume of his book, The Art of the Carpenter. He eventually wrote a total of four volumes on everything from carpentry, cabinet making, coach building, hand tools, and workshop layout. This is where the interesting part of the story begins. This is the famous Plate 11 from A.J. Rubeau's book, The Art of the Carpenter. On the top, it depicts an 18th century workshop, and below that is a side profile of a large timber frame workbench. Rubeau didn't invent this style of bench, and various other types of massive timber frame benches have been used for centuries. But the image was in his book and became the catalyst for what we now think of as the modern Rubeau workbench. Over the last 100 years, modern manufacturing and automation has nearly wiped out hand tool woodworking. It has declined to the point where the knowledge and benefits of these benches was nearly lost. The typical modern workbench is light and thin, more like a tall desk or assembly stand than the massive and robust designs of the past. Enter one Christopher Schwarz. Somewhere he stumbled across plate 11 and decided to build a Rubeau style bench and loved it. Fortunately for us, he documented the process and has shared his design with the world. The entire story of why and how he built his first Rubeau bench is wonderful, so please go read The Anarchist Workbench to find out the details. The Anarchist Workbench is free for digital download, but I encourage you to purchase one of his beautiful hardbound editions from Lost Art Press. It is fair to say that Chris's exploration and writing has influenced an entire generation of woodworkers. So what is so great about a Rubeau workbench? I will provide a pro-con section in a moment, but here are some of my reasons for building a Rubeau. First, I appreciate the design and solidity of the form. Second, I learned the hard way that racking and bench movement is not good for serious hand tool work. Third, since I was building it in stages, it was easy to fit into my free time. And finally, the recommendations and logic of a certain writer convinced me to go forth and Rubeau. Here's my short summary of pros and cons. Pros. Number one, the mass of the bench means it doesn't wander when doing robust hand planing. Number two, the strength of the joints means it doesn't rack or shake. Number three, the top is thick and makes for a stable work surface for chisel or plane work. Number four, incredible work holding, or as Chris likes to say, you can hold edges, ends, and faces. Number five, when using laminated lumber, it can be made inexpensively. Number six, durable. When the top gets marred or worn, you can grab a plane and reflatten it. Cons. Number one, heavy and large, hard to move. Number two, expensive if using expensive materials. Number three, time consuming if doing laminated construction. For a much more detailed dive into who Rubeau was, I recommend searching for Andre Jacob Rubeau, reading Christopher Schwarz's excellent blog, or just reading the English translation of With All the Precision Possible, Rubeau on Furniture by Lost Art Press. Now let's get on to the details about my Rubeau split top workbench. First, the specifications. Weight, 350 pounds when the lower shelf is empty. Dimensions, six foot two inches long, 25 inches deep, and 33 and a half inches tall. My height for reference is 5'10", and the top of the bench is at my knuckles when standing. Lumber, 25 2 by 10 8 foot long southern yellow pine. Leg vise lumber, 1 2 by 12 by 8 foot southern yellow pine. Leg vise hardware, Shop Fox Acme Screw Kit, which was roughly $40 on Amazon. Cost to build two years ago, $350. Glue, Tight bond to wood glue, and I used about a gallon. Type of clamps. This is critical. It must be a clamp that can exert a lot of pressure. I used three quarter inch pipe clamps. Minimum clamps needed, two per foot on the top slabs, alternating top and bottom, plus one at each end. I used 14 clamps on each slab. Clamp pressure. 
This one is addressed well in the Anarchist's workbench, but basically, tighten as hard as you can, wait 30 minutes and retighten, wait 30 more minutes and retighten again. Glue up time. I left all the leg and stretcher laminates sit in the clamps for 12 hours. The tops I left in the clamps for 24 hours each. Time to flatten the top varies, but for me it took about 4 hours. Freshening it or reflattening it only takes about an hour. Finish. Equal parts polymerized linseed oil, odorless mineral spirits, and oil-based spar varnish. Actual work time. 50 hours, much less if I'd had access to a joiner and planer. Elapsed time, 21 days. Ideally, you would have at least a 6-inch jointer and a 13-inch planer to get everything square and flat, but it can be done with a good hand plane and a lot of time. I use drawboard mortise and tenons for all the joints, and I feel proud that I did that on the tops before Chris Schwarz updated his preferred method in the Anarchist Workbench. Again, Chris goes into a lot of detail regarding the use of southern yellow pine, and I can confirm that it is relatively soft and easy to mar initially, and that it does harden with age. One negative that I did find to using pine was the difficulty in getting clean mortises. My chisels were plenty sharp, but still tended to tear the fibers. Yes, I know the pine is notorious for being difficult to cut cleanly. As you can see, my bench top has taken some abuse, and I did not install the draw bore on the front slab, as that one will be replaced with a southern yellow pine slab in the future. I made that one out of white pine as an experiment. One of the most frequent questions I'm asked is do the boards try to delaminate? The answer is no. Even with my shop's drastic seasonal humidity changes, I haven't had any gaps open up. Second, as I mentioned earlier, the prep and clamping is a critical aspect of joint reliability. The boards must be completely flat and have a clean face for the glue to really bond, and the high clamp pressure ensures that the glue pushes deep into the fibers. If I didn't mention it, I rolled a liberal amount of glue onto both sides of each mating surface. The squeeze out was incredible, but well worth the effort it took to clean up. I remember when I finished my workbench and I put the very first board on it. It didn't move, wobble, or wiggle, and the plane took one of those amazing shavings over the entire length of the board. Then I went again, and another whisper-thin shaving over the entire length. The work holding and stability of the design has let me work comfortably on projects that were previously impossible. I could pontificate about the praises of my bench for the next hour, but instead, I will just say that it does exactly what I ask of it every time. I hope you found this video informative, and if you are interested in more of my woodworking adventures, consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel.